right? That was a unique from Gen Chem 1, I guess. Um, well, so uh, Gen Chem 2 is going to be a little bit more on the math side of things. Uh, for 70% of you, you guys just had that moment, right? <laughs> it's going to be a little bit more focused on the formulas and that kind of thing, which lends itself to be, uh, how do we want to say this, kind of to shake out in two ways, right? If you feel or comfortable and confident in your math skills and, um, you know, that maybe, maybe it's, it's going to be a little bit easier for you guys. But if you're not, like I wasn't when I went to Gen Chem 2, right? was, for those of you guys who've had me before for a class, um, you know, I'm not making it up to, you know, relate or whatever you want to say with that. You know, it's like math wasn't my strong skill. It still isn't, right? And I made it this far at least, <laughs> right? But it's not because I just sat passively by and said, well, uh, I don't understand this and um, I just hope it never comes up again. <laughs> Okay, it's, it's gonna come up again, and the math isn't gonna get easier by you guys ignoring it, or not wanting to do it, or not needing to do it, or whatever it might be. And so, I'll go ahead and give you the trick on how to get through Gen Chem 2, right? Now, it's a trick that you guys already know, because you've been doing this your entire uh, academic career so far, right? So I'm gonna give you the trick that you already know. I'm gonna ask you guys to see the forest and the trees, right? I think it's a big secret to getting through Gen Chem 2. I'll give you a hint, some of you guys might have spent a couple hundred bucks on it. Huh? Yeah, your textbook, right? Look, here's the thing, right? I'm gonna present these equations to you guys, and they're gonna have a lot of variables in there, right? And you guys are gonna say, that sucks, it looks like alphabet soup, right? And it does. But if I give you guys an equation, Right, with five variables in it, what do I have to give you information about? Four of those, right? And you guys can figure out the, uh, the answer. Or I can give you an equation with 13 variables in there, right? And then what do I have to do? Hide in my office, because you guys are gonna get pissed, right? <laughs> no, right, but I have to give you information about the stuff that's in there for you guys to be able to solve it, right? That's the point. And so really the challenge of Gen Chem 2 comes from just interpreting what in the world is the information that you're given. Right? And so it becomes a little bit more of a mix of reading comprehension along with math, which, again, kind of inflates the challenge there, so to speak. Right? But the good news is that I'm not all that creative. Okay? What I mean with that is when I go to write an exam or a quiz and this kind of stuff for you guys, uh, I'm not going to come up with my own problems. You know why? Because the book already did my work for me. Isn't that amazing? It's easy to be a professor. I gotta work two hours today. I gotta teach this class, and then I got another one later on. Two whole, hour, two whole hours of work all today, right? And that's all I do. What I mean with that is, when I'm gonna write an exam for you guys or a quiz, I'm gonna go look for the book and the problems that are in there. And typically, for again, if you guys uh, were with me for a previous semester, right, when I write you guys a quiz, I'm gonna look at the stuff that's in the chapter, you know, the workout problems. So you guys have a chance to be able to work through exactly the stuff that's in there and see if you get the same answer and understand that and go through it, right? And then when it comes to the exams, I'll probably look in the back of the chapter there, right? For the stuff that's very similar to what you see in the chapter itself. But maybe not necessarily have the answer right in front of you, right? So it'd be a good idea for you guys to set a regular schedule, a habit, whatever you need to do, right? Make sure that you guys are following along appropriately with that. Because the stuff will get kind of thick and heavy pretty quick. Okay. The, the equations look kind of scary, the wording's kind of scary, the book kind of makes it intentionally scarier and just kind of gives you all this information. But all this stuff tends to be solved the same way, right? So all I'm saying with that is spend a little bit of time each day, right? Some of you guys might, it's gonna take a lot longer than others. And just, again, it just depends on how comfortable you are with your own math skills, is what it is. All right, good, yes. So I think there's my little spiel about Gen Chem 2, right? And you guys are all fired up. I'm all ready to go. So, um, we're gonna have some exams. Uh, we'll do them during the lab weeks there, kind of the uh, same thing that I think all of you guys had um, last semester, right? I know some of you guys were with Dr. Tom, and that was the wrong choice, and some of you guys were with me for the last semester, that was the obvious correct choice. 
right? <laughs> Probably to be one quarter, so I hope he sees this. Right? <laughs> anyway, but the, the point being, no matter who you have, right, all joking aside, right, we're going to be kind of handling the exam the same way. You guys will be uh, in a classroom. Hopefully, we can find a classroom for you guys, and then um, you guys will be taking the exams during um, uh, the, the, the lab times there, right? So we'll, we'll get that kind of uh, worked out as we get a little bit closer to the first exam, but just so you guys know that, right? In terms of quizzes, I'm gonna try and stick with about a quiz a week for you guys, and we'll do those online um, using the whole lockdown browser thing and that kind of stuff, which I think everybody's got that set up at least from a different class, yes. No, maybe somewhat. Some of you guys, yes, some of you guys, no. Yeah, what's up? I don't need a laptop, so yeah. I've got a review. Okay, that's fair. I'm gonna knock it out, like, but I'm not gonna blast it out to date or something, right? So I think it, it shouldn't be too hard. But uh, that's what we'll do in terms of quizzes because I get the feeling that um, you know people will be see, uh, still kind of in and out all semester long, given the circumstances, right? So we'll see. We'll see how we can avoid any um, let's see makeup exams and quizzes and that kind of stuff. But you know we'll we'll adapt as we can, right? Uh, I think we've all been through one semester with this, so you guys kind of know the the rigmarole of how it is. But just you know send me an email if you guys are going to be out. Um, I, I probably won't respond if you say, hey, Dr. H, I'm not going to be there. It's not that I don't care, it's just I, you know, like, okay, you know, what do you want me to say? <laughs> I got your emails, I promise, right? So just let me know if you're out, and then if you're going to miss something, uh, let me know when we can work out, you know, a makeup time or something like that with them, right? Does that make, make sense? All I'm really saying is communicate with me, right? And if you have a question about anything, or if you're not going to be here, or whatever it might be, just send me an email. I promise I'll respond to you. Right, at some point, I'm a little bit, little bit, you know, my joking aside, I don't just work two hours a day. <laughs> so I'm a little bit busy and behind on some of my emails and that kind of stuff, but I will get back to you as soon as I can, I promise you that. Uh, in terms of the labs, uh, I'm not teaching any of the labs. That's again, Dr. Tong and uh, Dr. Freeze are doing that. Uh, they should have their syllabus for you guys. Uh, so make sure that you guys kind of look at that. There should be a separate course for you guys on Canvas already, yes? yes, yes, yes. Do you guys have a lab this week already? You do? No? Yes, no, maybe. I don't know. I'm asking you guys. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, some of you guys may have a lab. We don't know. It'll be a surprise. But figure it out, right? <laughs> Take a look at the syllabus. The I know the schedule's in there for you guys for that, too, right? So remember the same thing with the lab goes as with it was last semester there. Make sure you guys come prepped, you know, with goggles and appropriate attire and all that kind of stuff, too, right? Yes? Anybody got new goggles for Christmas? No. What did you guys get? Useful things? <laughs> all right. <laughs> anyway, all right. So I think I think that's kind of uh, let's see. We talked about quizzes and exams and how to get a guaranteed A in Gen Chem two. Uh, what else are we going to talk about? Um, I'm going to be recording the lectures. I'm going to be posting them to the YouTube channel there. Um, I'm going to try and like I know I said to you guys an announcement about this too, but I'm going to try and figure out um, how to get themes concurrent with a recording and all this kind of stuff, but. Technology um, is missing, so <laughs> but we'll, we'll try and figure something clever out. But if you guys are gone, there's always going to be a recording. It's always going to be online. And uh, the good news about that is that you can watch me at double speed, right? So a one-hour class just flies on by, right? So, but anyway, uh, so if you do miss something, you're not going to be missing a lecture is kind of what it is. And hopefully we'll get the whole team things kind of settled too. Okay. Let's see, what other managerial things that I have to chat with you guys about. Um, I think that's it. I'm not saying. Do you guys have any immediate burning questions? Yeah. I'll get I'll get it. I, that, that's where I'm that's where I'm coming from. <laughs> All right. So since you guys know everything about everything, which is why you said you guys didn't have any questions, I'm gonna go ahead and make a prediction. Now what you guys didn't realize is that when you do become a professor, you get certain uh, superpowers, right? One of these things is I can predict the future, right? Now, it's nothing useful, but I'm gonna predict, right, that a certain percentage of you guys are gonna start to struggle in this class at some point, right? And you look at me and you say, that guy's scary because he has a red tie. So I'm not gonna go to his office hours, right? Um, let's see, and then you're like, well, uh, I don't know what to do then, right? I don't know where to go, I'm not quite sure where to get help. Well, you're on your own is all I'm saying, right? No one's there to help you and sorry, right? 
No, right? Of course not. Look, there's plenty of help for you guys. I'm always in my office, okay? I've got office hours. I can't even remember what's on the outside of my door, okay? But I'll be there during that time. I'll figure it out. <laughs> I think it's like in the afternoons on Monday to Wednesday or something like that, okay? But I'm usually in my office a lot outside of just, you know, the, the, the office hours that are there, right? So you're always welcome to come by and knock. I'm there and you guys come by and you say, hey, Dr. H, do you have a couple minutes? I'll say two things. Yeah, or no, come back later, right? That's it, I'm not gonna get mad at you, I'm not gonna get upset at you. I'm, I'm, my job is here to help you guys out, right? And the only way I can do that is if I'm in my office and now you guys know where I am, I'm on the second floor, right? And come by, knock, hey, do you have a couple minutes? Yes or no, I'll answer yes or no and we'll figure something out, right? So what I'm saying is if you've got a question, just come by and see me, right? If I'm not in my office, I'll be back soon or whatever it might be, I am human so I do eat. Right? So, and I don't, you know, I don't really have one of those out, you know, out for lunch signs, but I'll, I'll be around and I'll be back, right? Otherwise, send me an email and say, hey, Dr. H, can we set up an appointment? And if you send me an email like that, just tell me what time do you guys have available? Because I get a lot of emails that say, hey, Dr. H, are you available? And I'll, and I'll immediately email back, what time do you guys have? Right? And then you'll email me that information anyway. So we'll just we'll simplify and just say, just tell me what time do you guys have available? Uh, do you have time to meet Tuesday at 3 o'clock? All right, and I'll say yes or no. Got it? So that's fine. I'll get back to you guys. Okay. Now, if you don't want to come see me, right, uh, we also have Laura, who's in the children center over there. Um, Laura, do you want to come give a quick this and that? Yeah, do you want to give my phone? Uh, of course I do. No, no one, they don't want to turn around because they want to stare at you in the corner. I do like the corner. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Laura. Um, if you came to me last semester, you already know me, but I'm the tutor for all the chemistry classes. So if you have friends in other chemistry classes, you can come with them to see me for tutoring. Um, so tutoring for me this semester is gonna be a little bit different just because I have a more crazy schedule. So I won't be having regularly scheduled tutoring hours every week. That way I'm not just sitting in the tutoring room being sad because no one is coming to see me. Instead, I'm just gonna be on my computer all the time and you can message me or email me and we can set a time up. That way, we're both getting the most out of our time together, and we're not just sitting around waiting for the other to be available. Um, also, that way, we can have longer periods of time if you want to set up a one-on-one, -on -one, if you want you and your study group to come in. There's just more flexibility that way. Um, so you can email me. My Ava email is just like lara.osborne, blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm also on the Tutoring Center Teams page, which you should all be on from last semester. If you're not on it, that's okay. You can just Google like tutoring Ave Maria and get in there. Um, but you can just message me on Teams. That's probably like the fastest way to get to me. And then we can just set up a time. So because I won't be having those regularly scheduled hours, it'll just be whenever you guys want. Another thing I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna start hosting review sessions before y'all's exams. So I'm gonna get the syllabus from Dr. H and every time y'all have an exam or maybe a bunch of you have a quiz you're really worried about, we will just set up a time either in this classroom or in the library or something and we'll just come and we'll talk about whatever, we'll work through whatever homework problem. But that way we can all be together and it can be right before your exam. Because sometimes if I say only have tutoring hours on Wednesday and your exam isn't till the next Monday, you don't come see me and then you just have five days of study by yourself. But this way we can do it like maybe the night before, maybe two nights before so that we can really drill in whatever y'all want done before your exam. So I'll be sending out messages probably in y'all's like Canvas page or something about like review sessions and that kind of thing. We'll probably try to do evenings, I think just because that works better for people, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So reach out to me if you want help. Besides that, I'll be around for review sessions so you won't forget I exist. And that's it today. They should be able to contact you through Canvas also, right? Yeah, if so, you go into your, I'll be like in your Canvas page. So if you get into Canvas, you can find my name and click on it and message me. And I'm sure you'll post this kind of information there. Uh, yeah. When you get in there too, so. Yeah. So I'll by email, by Canvas, by Teams. All that kind of stuff. If you see me, you can also like count me down. That too. And I won't well, remember who you are, but. And don't recognize the top third of your face, right? So. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> but yeah, so I'll send this also out like in a Canvas thing. So you can get all that information. Cool. And what is it? This semester it's only thirty-five dollars an hour. Is that what it is? Uh, fifty. Oh, it went up. Oh my goodness. Jeez. <laughs> no, it's free. <laughs> Absolutely free, right? So you guys are already. Need to help you. 
You guys are already paying for these services, right? Is what it is. So you don't have to do it, but it's your you're right, it's your choice and it's available and it's there and uh, you didn't you didn't take Jen Kent with me, I forget that, right? No, I took it a very, very long time ago. Yeah, right. But Laura's uh, Laura's uh, been uh, is a senior now, right, and graduating yeah. in biochem, so she absolutely knows what she's doing. Taking all the chemistry classes here. There you go. Where else would you take? Right? No other, no other choices. <laughs> right. So Laura absolutely knows what she's doing, and, and she's also uh, she buzzed my organic class, and so when you guys get through organic, uh, well, never mind. You're graduating, right? So. Yeah. You, okay, well, you can so, contact her at med school or wherever she's in. Yeah, yeah. right, so. <laughs> like, I know how to eat tests or all that kind of stuff, so if this is your first time in the class, yep. I have all the things there. That's right. So she'll prep you guys for the physical fitness portion of the exams, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. 10 push ups while doing this. <laughs> well, that's easy. All right. So, anyways, I think that's all the stuff that I really need to share with you guys. Um, again, if you have any questions, just swing by or contact me or Laura. Joe is not tutoring. I do not know if there are any other kinds of units in here. Chase the rest of them away. Makes sense. All right. Very, very rigorous. You get to talk to me that much more. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. All right. So if you guys have any questions, then you know, feel free to reach out to me, and uh, we'll we'll get right to it then. So, um, all right. So where we're going to start, I guess, is a little bit of a review uh, from Gen Chem 1. Now, the reason why we kind of start here, and if I had my ways, we'd kind of put this at the end of the semester because it's a natural progression uh, into, uh, into um, organic chemistry, but unfortunately, I don't make all the decisions here, or fortunately, I don't make all the decisions. But what we want to talk about is just why things are solid liquids and gases, and what influence does that have, or what do we need to pay attention to, or why do we care, right, that kind of thing. So I'm kind of drawing together uh, parts of chapters 11 um, and 12 into here. Um, I know we already talked some about chapter 11, uh, but we're just going to kind of review that a little bit because it's honestly one of the most important parts of all of chemistry. And, um, and then we'll kind of tie into some new ideas here that will relate to the next chapter we'll get into, which is kind of the solubility and solutions and that kind of stuff. Okay. So we're going to talk about the intermolecular forces as kind of the main, the main idea here. Now, we're going to talk about something that's new, right? Did you know that there are different states of matter? Wow, right? We have our solids, we have our liquids, and our gases. Now, we talked a lot about uh, gases last semester, right? We had that entire chapter about gas laws and the ideal gas law and the relationship between pressure and volume and temperature and moles and all that kind of stuff, which you guys all remember. No, nobody remembers. I see nothing but just shocked stares. Yes, gas laws a little bit, somewhat, kind of. What's the big gas law that, you know, equation that you guys are probably expected to memorize? Hmm? Yeah, you remember what it is? There you go, right? PV equals NRT, right? So remember that was an entire chapter that kind of dealt with all that stuff there, right? So fortunately, we don't have to go back through that stuff because you guys already passed that part of the class, right? Now, we're gonna be coming back to some gas law type stuff a little bit later when we talk about equilibrium, right? But, uh, the, you know, we, 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 I guess the point I'm trying to make is we understand what's going on with gases and what it is. Now, we also talked a little bit about liquids and solutions last semester, right? We talked about solubility rules. You guys remember those? A little bit, maybe, kind of. You guys remember the precipitation reactions? Where you guys mix two ionic solids and something precipitates out, right? And you guys have to predict the net ionic equation and the complete ionic equations, yes? Did we ever talk about why certain things are soluble, though? Or did we ever talk about why certain things are insoluble? Uh, no, we just kind of looked at that table of solubility rules and went through that, right? So one thing we'll start to kind of draw out from this chapter is a little bit about how do we predict whether things are going to be soluble or not. Now I think you guys had a lab last semester where you guys were trying to dissolve different salts into waters and different solvents, is that? Was that you guys, right? So you guys started to talk a little bit about this there, right? And so we'll kind of just uh, put the pin back into it here just so it sticks, right? But anyway, just to, just to kind of summarize here, 
Um, you know, you guys uh, know about solids, liquids, and gases. Unfortunately, uh, we don't really talk too much about crystalline solids in this class. I just don't, I'll be honest, like the, the, they want me to talk about it with you guys. And then they want us to sit there and look at unit cells and okay, here's a face centered cubic and blah, 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 blah. Just, it doesn't, it doesn't add anything to you guys, right? And, and so my, my view on things for you guys who are new is I'm not gonna introduce anything to you guys that either, I don't know how to put this. Um, everything I try to introduce to you guys will be something that we build upon later on. I'm not saying it's necessarily immediately going to be within that chapter, right? And if you go back to what I was just talking about earlier, I said this is one of the most important chapters, not just because of what we're gonna do in Gen Chem, but for those of you guys who are going on to organic. How many of you guys are going on to organic chemistry? All right, so I'm gonna see you guys again, probably. <laughs> All right? But for those of you guys who are going on to organic, these intermolecular forces are key essential ideas and concepts. And when I get into the first semester of organic chemistry with you guys, I'm gonna ask you guys a question. I'm gonna ask you guys, what do you guys remember from Gen Chem? And you know what answer you're gonna give me? Yep, that answer right there, <laughs> right? <laughs> the dead silence. <laughs> uh, I don't know, Dr. H, that was like two months ago. <laughs> I don't remember that, right? But here's the thing with, with chemistry, and, and again, maybe I, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want this to be story time with Dr. H, but um, I wasn't always a chemist. And I started out in engineering, and, and then I ended up taking organic chemistry as part of that sequence, and then I, I switched at that point is what it is. Um, and so when I went through Gen Chem, I hated it. I was like, what's the point, right? Okay, so you memorize this, all right, periodic table, blah, 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 yada, yada, all these kind of things. The thing with chemistry is it's, it's not really until you get to biochem, right, <laughs> where you're like, crap, I should have remembered. So what, what do you need to remember for biochem? Oh, there you go, okay. <laughs> so you need to remember everything, right? Why do we call this general chemistry? Is it because it's just general knowledge and it's good to remember for the bar trivia so you win a tab? No, right? It's because this is the foundation that everything else kind of builds up on, right? The idea of how solids, liquids, and gases behave affects you know, uh, biochemistry and organic, and we don't do inorganic chemistry here or physical chemistry, but all these things are we're laying the foundation for this stuff, right? This is so, what I've realized in my, in my career at least is that uh, Gen Chem is the thing that I keep referring back to over and over and over again when I you know, start to teach these more advanced classes, right? So what I'm saying is that when I give you guys this kind of, hey, we'll do this in organic chemistry, or hey, we'll, we'll come back to this later, you know, this is something to pay attention to for you guys who are moving on in chemistry, right? Because if you, do a good job of remembering this now, and you start to understand the ideas behind it now, then it's gonna make your life in OCHEM that much easier, right? It's still gonna, it's still gonna be difficult, I'm just saying it's gonna be that much easier. You don't have to relearn Gen Chem, is what it is, right? So, but uh, solids, liquids, and gases and the intermolecular forces is kind of what the, the first main topic is here, right? Now we talked about kinetic molecular theory and all that kind of stuff, and uh, uh, we talked about temperature quite a bit in the first, uh, in the first semester there, and we'll see that come back a little bit here. But the, things, uh, the thing to really pay attention to are those intermolecular forces. Now, I've got um, a little bit of an argument with some of these textbooks. Uh, you know, they say, I think some textbooks say there's three, some say there's five, I think your textbooks say there's four, whatever, right? I'm not too interested in how many intermolecular forces there are, aside from you guys understanding these three right here. Because if you guys understand these three right here, then it doesn't matter. Because in reality, there's probably close to 20 or 30 intermolecular forces. We just don't talk to you guys about them. Do you know why? Because I can't lock the doors from the outside. You guys would run screaming if we have to talk about all these 20 different intermolecular forces, okay? But here's the thing, right? Do you think I have memorized all of those 30 intermolecular forces? No, you guys think I'm dumb. Okay, fine, all right. <laughs> Here's the thing, how do these intermolecular forces work? That's the question to ask. What's going on behind the scenes with these things, okay? Do I need to sit there and memorize the three intermolecular forces? Maybe, right, if that's what you wanna do, it's your choice. I'm not gonna tell you how to learn something, right? You guys know better than that about yourself, right, how you learn things. But what I want you guys to think about a little bit is how do they work, right? 
Now, they're on the screen there, right? There's kind of an eye exam, maybe if you're in the back of the classroom, right? But my lecture slides are online for you guys too, so you can print them out and, 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 and um, uh, bring them in if you'd like, right? So what are the three intermolecular forces? What do you guys remember with that? You're close as the board. What do you read there? What's number one? Um, dispersion forces, right? So, what do we remember from dispersion forces? A couple of very important things. What do you guys remember? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Weakest of the three. Huh? Weakest of the three. Ah, what do you mean by the weakest? It's uh, the forces that hold the molecules together are the less strongest, least strongest. <laughs> the least strongest forces between what though? Two molecules. Aha, uh -huh, between a set of molecules, right? Yes. So remember, when we're talking about intermolecular forces, right, we're talking about how one molecule talks to the other, right? That's why some of you guys sat next to each other and some of you guys didn't, right? Why do you guys sit next to each other? Well, there's only so much space, Dr. Reeves. No, I got that, right? But you also, right, you come in here and you sit next to your friends. Why? Is it easier for you to communicate with somebody you know? One of you guys is answering yes, the rest of you guys are like, no, no, I'm good, I'm very social, I just talk to everybody, <laughs> right? You guys get the point I'm saying here? You sit next to your friends, you talk to the people who have similar interests and all this kind of stuff. How do you think molecules behave? The exact same way, right? They're gonna talk to something, it's gonna be easier for them to talk to something that has similar properties, similar behavior, similar atoms, all these kind of things, right? So it's the exact same way here. So dispersion forces, like Andy was talking about there, it's, uh, he mentioned that they're the weakest. Why? What makes a dispersion force? Probability. Aha, uh -huh. probability of what? It's very short-lived, right? Dispersion. Yeah, you've got, you're, you're hitting the bullet points for it, but of what? Probability of what? You know, the temporary nature of what? The electrons. The electrons. Right? So here's, um, here's a good answer. I'm gonna give you guys, I'll go, I don't know, it's the first day, should I give them all the, the secrets to success already? You guys might not come back. I'm like, no, I already, you told me if you're not just kidding. Right? There's always uh, two very good answers in all of chemistry, okay? For everything, all the way up through biochem, okay? The two smart answers are sterics and electronics, okay? Seriously, I mean, this worked all the way through grad school, even when I was doing my, <laughs> my doctoral defense, right? That's how I started my answers. Oh, oh Professor Gore, oh, yeah, very smart. <laughs> right? Sterics and electronics. Sterics is basically the, uh, an argument arising from where atoms are, how they are arranged. If you remember back in Gen Chem, we talked about geometries. Right? Linear and trigonal planar and tetrahedral and octahedral and bipyramidal and T-shaped and blah, 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 blah. Yes? All those that you guys all have here still? No, none of you guys. Man, who did you guys have for gym cam? Mm -hmm. Man, that guy must have stuck. Oh, it was me, crap, right? <laughs> right? But that's the, that's the sterics, okay? How the atoms are arranged, how the molecules are physically arranged, okay? Electronics deals with where the electrons are, okay? If we know where the electrons are, we know how to do chemistry. Why? Well, what does chemistry? The electrons, okay? All of the chemistry that you guys are gonna learn from now until the end of time, well, unless you guys become nuclear engineers, right? So, with the exception of nuclear engineers, the chemistry that you guys are gonna learn are where the electrons start and where they end up. That's really it, okay? And that's why I became a chemist, because I can remember two things, sterics and electronics, okay? So if you guys can remember that, then sorry, you gotta become a chemist, right? <laughs> You've got no other choice, right? Oh wait, we don't have a chemistry major. You guys still have a chemistry minor here now? I forget. Is there still a chemistry minor? Okay, so you can become a partial chemist, which is, yeah, not too bad, right? But anyway, so those are the two, two smart things there, right? So when I ask you guys a question on an exam, maybe, or a quiz, and I say, explain this idea to me, and you're like, I don't have a clue on how to answer that. Go back and think about those two places to begin with. Because when I ask you a question, 
why do dispersion forces happen or where do they originate from? And you're like, I don't know. Your first thought should be, well, does it have to relate with spherics? Maybe, right? Does it have to relate with electronics? Maybe, right? And then you start to branch your way out from there, right? Can you explain those two again, spherics and electronics? The kind of the definitions? Just what it, what are they? Well, okay, so the answer, I can't, I can't answer that for you because it's, it's, we have to apply them a little bit differently in each case. Right, so where I was gonna, what I was about to say, and maybe this will help answer your question, is whenever you guys do answer spherics or electronics, my immediate follow-up is gonna be how, or why, or what do they do, right? Because in different cases, those spherics and electronics are gonna impart different properties, okay? And we'll talk about that in just a little bit here, okay? But I'm giving you guys a starting point so that you're not just, you know, out in the middle of the ocean just kind of treading water. Fix your eyes on the distance and start moving towards that target, right? Okay, I'm gonna explain sterics, and then you start explaining it down that path later, okay? But anyway, so uh, the question was, well, what are dispersion forces? And Andy gave the answer of uh, they are temporary and, uh, what was the other? Prob uh, something about probability, right? So temporary and probability. Of what? Of the electrons. Now, where do electrons live? Shells. So they live in uh, the, by the ocean, right? And the uh, conch shells, right? Native to South Florida. <laughs> what do you mean by shells? The orbitals around the nucleus. Hmm. The orbitals. Okay. Do you guys remember about orbitals? Did we learn about those? Hmm? Thank you. <laughs> One person remembers, right? Do you guys remember talking about your quantum numbers? N and L and M sub L and M sub S? Two people now, all right, we're, I'm up to almost 10% uh, of the class now, right? <laughs> if we just had three people nodding, we'd be there, right? Okay, all right, do you guys remember about the quantum numbers though? Do you guys remember about the principal quantum numbers and how to figure that out? And what L tells you, remember L tells us the shape, whether it's spherical or whether it's a P orbital, right? The S, the P, the D, and the F, and all that kind of stuff, right? And so when I ask you guys about where do electrons live, they are living in those orbitals, and I'm just asking you guys to kind of remember the, uh, uh, the different blocks and the locations in the periodic table where they are, okay? I'm not gonna ask you guys about quantum numbers in this, in this uh, um, semester, right? But I would expect you guys to say, well, you know, uh, this is, you know, we've got our valence electrons in the S shell for this atom, right? You guys remember your blocks in the periodic table? The S, the P, the D, and the F blocks. Can you guys find those again? That'd be useful. I did not take a quick peek at it. And um, did I post that review for you guys? Or was that for Jen? I forget now. But there are some like review videos on YouTube about you know what should you remember from Gen Chem? You know what should you remember from these different classes? So if you guys are kind of you know still knocking the rust off from last semester, then it might be a good thing to kind of take a peek at. It, okay. So dispersion forces. We're looking at temporary. Probability of our electrons. Well, what does that mean? Well, you guys are stationary in your seats right now, right? So you guys are bristling with energy, sort of, at 8.50 in the morning in a Gen Chem class, <laughs> right? You guys want to be up and moving around and, I don't know, whatever, whatever, you know, whatever you guys want to do with your day, right? Maybe go back to sleep. Um, then that, that my analogy fails, but, right? You guys have some energy and you guys need to get stuff done during the day. Electrons are like that, right? They're always moving around, all right? And just like with me, because I'm an antsy, I tend to be an antsy person, right? I tend to walk around while I'm lecturing, right? And if I'm over on this side of the room, then these guys, right, get the full blast of Dr. H's lame analogies and jokes, right? But I have to spread myself out. Otherwise, I'll wear out their laughter over there. Right, as you guys can tell, right? I'm already wearing it thin, right? <laughs> right? I've got to come over to this side of the classroom and work on the jokes over here a little bit, right? Okay, thank you, right? <laughs> right? But I've got to be moving around, and just like that, the electrons are moving back and forth, okay? And if I'm an electron, and I'm hanging out over here on this side of the classroom, okay? That means that over here, it's a little bit more negative, right? What about the other side of the room? If I'm an electron on a molecule and I'm hanging out over here, then this side of the molecule is negative. What about over there? It's a little bit more positive, right? If 
But how, how long do I stay over there? Just some of the time, right? And then I start making my way over here. And now this side of the, class, the, the classroom feels negative, right? And what about that over there? Then it feels positive. So that's what we're talking about with the movement of electrons. Sometimes electrons are at one end of the molecule, sometimes they're on the other. And when that happens, it creates partial negatives and partial positives, right? What happens when you put a negative and a positive together? Hmm? <clears throat> oh, oh, so hang on to that thought, right? You're right, but hang on to that. What happens when you put a negative and a positive close to each other, I should say then? They attract. Got it? So how do all of the intermolecular forces work? We find something negative and we find something positive. Now we have different levels of negative and positive, right? We have partials and we have complete negatives and positives. What happens if I pull a, put a full negative and a full positive together? Then we end up making some kind of neutral compound, right? Hmm. What happens if I put a sodium cation with a chloride anion? What do I end up making? I end up making an ionic compound, a salt, right? A neutral species. Did you guys talk about ionic compounds last semester? Yep. Yeah. Could you guys name ionic compounds? Two people again, All right? We're still, uh, still about at the 9% uh, rate, <laughs> right? Do you guys remember the naming, right? We have variant and invariant and the, the polyatomics. You guys still remember those? I love my polyatomics. They're going to show up on your exams. You guys are going to say, oh, crap, what's a nitrate? Uh, I think that's the one with the phosphorus in the middle, right? No, right? You guys remember your polyatomics? They will show up everywhere, I promise. Going back to the statement I made earlier, I wouldn't make you guys memorize something if it wasn't something that's key and important for everything, right? And the polyatomics are one of these things I just harp on. You guys got to know them. Know their names, know their charges. Got it? Good stuff. So we make these ionic compounds and we talk about that. Now, that's a different type of intermolecular force and that's sometimes why we have this expanded list, right? Ionic forces are sometimes listed here on your intermolecular forces. And that's just a coulombic attraction, right? We have a full negative and a full positive. They just come together and they uh, arrange themselves in a specific lattice, right? That kind of thing, right? Now with the dispersion, we're on kind of the opposite end of that. We're on the partial negative and the partial positive. It's me walking back and forth in the classroom here. Sometimes it's negative over here and sometimes it's positive over there. And that separation of charges is gonna cause an attraction between molecules. Got it? Now, what if I had you guys all stand up and we all pretend to be electrons and all of us move to one side of the classroom, okay? You guys wanna do that? Nobody said no, all right, you guys here. I gave you a choice, everyone get up now, right? Okay, you guys are with me, right? So pretend they're all electrons, we all stand up and I make you guys walk over to this side of the classroom, right? Now we're temporarily over here. But what happens with that negative charge that we build up? It's a bigger negative charge, right? If we're a bigger negative charge because we're all on that side, what about the positive? It's also a bigger positive charge. Well, what happens when you put a negative and a positive together? They I attract. And what if I have a bigger negative and positive? What's a, what about that attraction? It's stronger, right? It's a bigger attraction. It's a bigger intermolecular force. Is it still a dispersion? Yes, because I'm just temporarily on one side versus the other, okay? It's just us walking back and forth in the classroom. Got it? Okay, so let's think here for just a second. Methane, CH4, right, CH4. How many valence electrons does methane have? Hmm? Four around the carbon. Eight. Eight, right, four around the carbon and one for each of the hydrogens, right? You guys remember how to get your valence electrons? important, uh, very arbitrary table do we need? Our periodic table, okay? Not arbitrary at all, but if you guys can't remember how to get your balance electrons, come see me, you guys have to look it up or whatever you need to do. 
right? So if I've got eight valence electrons, I can move eight things from one side to the other. Okay. Now let's pretend I have DNA. How many electrons are in DNA? A billions. Okay. Now what happens if I start to move billions of electrons from one side to the other? Is that a bigger charge? Is that going to be a bigger dispersion? What do you think is one of the most important things that DNA uses to attract or repel other molecules? Where it actually does come down to its dispersion. It's massive. It's got a huge dispersion force with it. So the bigger the molecular weight of a compound, right, the higher its dispersion force is. That's what the book says. Does it have anything to do with the actual molecular weight, though? Did I mention anything about weight until the last 30 seconds? No. So does it have anything to do with the weight? No. What does it have to deal with? Hmm? The amount of electrons, right? That's all it comes down to, right? It just comes down to how many electrons there are. Is iodine heavier than fluorine? Is iodine heavier than fluorine? Yes. Does that matter in terms of its dispersion? No, what matters is its electrons. Got it? Why? Now we could argue about why iodine is heavier and all that kind of stuff, and you know, we could talk about protons, neutrons, yada, 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 right? But do you guys get the point? It all comes down to the electrons. And the odd thing about dispersion is it's either the weakest force or it's one of the strongest. When you get to large molecules like polymers and things like that, it's one of the dominant forces. In, um, in the intermolecular, right? But you kind of have to get to pretty heavy stuff for that. And so that's why in the textbook it says it's the weakest, because we tend to deal with really small atoms, or excuse me, small molecules in here, okay? But understand that it's, you know, you can get on both sides of the spectrum there with that thing. Okay. Good. What do we got next? So dipole, dipole. All right. So I'm going to ask you guys the exact same set of questions. What in the world is a dipole, dipole? out treading in the middle of the ocean. So like the force between two polar molecules. Aha, so the force between two polar molecules, okay. So what in the world is a polar molecule? What do you mean by that? Doesn't it have like a high partial charge? Okay, so we've got partial charges again. But what's different about a dipole partial charge than a dispersion partial charge? Maybe, maybe, maybe. Hmm, let me say. Hmm. What's unique about a dipole? How many of you guys have ever played with magnets? All of you guys, right? Okay. Do magnets lose their charge? If they get hot, right, that kind of stuff, right? You know, but your refrig do you guys have a refrigerator magnet you made your parents? Like when you were in kindergarten and they still keep it on there? Oh, right. My parents threw it away. <laughs> right? You guys right? You guys give this stuff, you know, as gifts when you're kids, right? Do those magnets, you know, lose their charge? Or are they permanently have a positive and a negative end to it? Well, magnets are permanent, right? So what's a dipole? Well, a dipole is a permanent partial charge, right? As opposed to dispersion, we've got a permanent separation of partial negatives and positives. How does that happen? What one important thing that we talked about a lot in Gen Chem 1, do we, get, do we see a permanent separation of partial charges? In the geometry. Mm. Sort of, you're on the right track. Before we get to the geometry, we need to recognize one thing, though, and then we bring that in. What other very important concept, one of our periodic trends that we talked about? Mm -hmm. oh, um, Aha, electronegativity, right? You guys remember that term a little bit? So what is electronegativity then? I saw some nods in the back row there. You want to venture a guess at me? I'm sorry, what is, what is your name? Chris. Chris, that's right. That's right. It's going to take you like 15 weeks to learn that name, and then the semester will be over, but it's good. <laughs> Chris, what do you remember from the electronegativity? Um, I remember the stuff in the 
it is more or less the negative of mm -hmm. electronegative. That's absolutely correct. Do you remember what the most electronegative atom is? What's in the top right of the periodic table? Ah, okay, so it, you're, you're right. <laughs> you're absolutely correct, so you got me on that one. However, the noble gases are, are kind of in their own little realm, but you, you, you got it there. So if I, I used to, I used to like throw Jolly Ranchers to, to, to students who tricked me, but apparently I wasn't allowed to give out candy. But I don't know, it's different here, so. It's like, what is it, like Halloween? Like I'm, I'm hiding something in the Jolly Rancher? Right? <laughs> Anyway, but you're absolutely correct. So helium's up there. However, helium is uh, in its own little realm. What is the most electronegative atom, though? Yeah? Hmm? Fluorine. Fluorine, perfect, right? So fluorine's your most electronegative atom, right? What does it mean to be electronegative, though? What is it going to be? the proclivity, a tendency, a disposition, as, as Laura said there, to attract electrons. How do you attract electrons? Well, how do you attract bees to your garden? Do they just show up? Sometimes, right, if you're unlucky. <laughs> how do you attract bees to your garden? Or butterflies, sorry, let's make something a little bit pretty. Or hummingbirds. Do they just show up for no reason? No, you gotta give them a reason, right? You gotta have a big garden. Huh? You gotta have a big garden. Gotta have a big garden, right? If I'm gonna try to attract some butterflies, I better plant some what? Some flowers, right? Some something, bird feeders, if I'm trying to attract the birds, right? That kind of stuff, right? Give them a reason to come, is what I'm trying to say, right? So I'm asking you the question, how do you attract electrons to your garden? It's going to have big ranges. <laughs> Careful. i got to plant some positive charges, right? What is an electron? Something really small that we can barely see, don't really see, sometimes see, right? That has what charge? Negative. How do I attract anything that's negative? Give it something positive. Where is the only positive things in the universe? In the nucleus, the protons, right? That's it. So how do I make something very electronegative? Well, it's got to have a nice, attractive nucleus, right? And who wouldn't want that, right? So the electrons are going to try and get as close as you can to the nucleus. That's all it is. So do you need a big atom or a small atom to be very electronegative? small, right? Because remember, radius just is a measure of how close you are to the middle. So if you have a really small radius, you're going to be close to where the, where the protons are. That's all. Got it? So remember, we talked about radius and electronegativity and ionization energy and all that kind of stuff. Fluorine is the most electronegative. Oxygen is number two. Nitrogen is number three. And then chlorine is number four. And books are going to argue with me about chlorine and nitrogen, but guess what? I make the rules, right? So the point being is, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but for our purpose in here, um, nitrogen is more electronegative than chlorine is. I think this book agrees with me. I forget if it does. It doesn't matter, right? Well, it does. Actually, it does matter. I should, I should take that back. Not what matters. I need to be right. So I'm joking, <laughs> right? Anyway, so it's, it's always good information or kind of good to remember the top four electronegative atoms. Mm -hmm. That's gonna help you guys uh, predict whether there's going to be dipoles that form and these kind of things, right? So back up, if we have dipole-dipole interactions, we've got an electronegative atom attached to a less electronegative atom. The more electronegative atom is pulling the electrons towards itself, causing a permanent separation in partial charges. And what happens when you put positives and negatives close to each other? They attract, right? Whether it's a permanent separation or a temporary separation, that attraction is gonna happen, got it? So is there anything really different between a dispersion and a dipole? 
There's really only one thing, which is what? Whether it's temporary or whether it's permanent. That's it. Got it? It both works the same way. It's negative and positive. Okay? And we could just finish this up real quick and talk about hydrogen bonding there. And hydrogen bonding is just a special case of a dipole-dipole. That's all it is. If you guys can uh, complete the I exam there, right, it says that uh, hydrogen bonding occurs with fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen when it's bound to a hydrogen. That is classical hydrogen bonding. And the reason why that happens is because there's a big difference in the electronegativity of fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen as compared to hydrogen. And when you have a big difference in electronegativity, you make partial negatives and partial positives and things can come together and then hydrogen bond and blah, 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 blah. Okay? Hydrogen bonding is one of the most important intermolecular forces on the planet. Right? It's what causes ice to float. What causes the double helix of DNA to form, right? And those are two pretty darn important things that you guys end up seeing here, right? Those are just two very small, short, trite examples of where it shows up. But anyway, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. It's just going to kind of summarize what we talked about for the last, uh, how long was I yammering? About 40 minutes now? Oof, good, right? It's going to just kind of summarize all that kind of stuff that we talked about there, right? These different ideas of the different intermolecular forces. This is this this right here, right? Understanding that concept that we just talked about is what's what's extremely important. Being able to recognize the intermolecular forces and what that means and what implications does it have and where's your negatives and where's your positives and all these kind of things. Now I tell you that, and you guys are kind of like, yeah, okay, I believe that, right? But the unfortunate truth is some of these ideas are gonna kind of just poof away for the for Gen Ken too. Um, they're gonna be kind of working behind the scenes, but because of the class and what we're doing here, uh, we kind of have to you know, um, shelve some of those ideas for a little bit. But uh, I promise, I promise, like I said, for you guys coming on to organic, this is gonna be like the first lecture of organic chemistry also. Like these are these just core ideas that come back over and over. That's why I spend a lot of time with you guys here. Right? Okay, um, oh right, so just one, uh, one, one, one small little distinction here. So remember the intermolecular forces are between, and if I talk about intramolecular, right, then we're talking about covalent bonds versus ionic bonds and that kind of stuff, right? And we talked about bonding and all that kind of stuff a little bit in uh, Gen Chem 1, but now in Gen Chem 2, we're gonna come back and take a look at uh, a little bit more detail about how we calculate certain energetic costs and stuff that comes along with these intramolecular interactions, okay? Cool, there. So just a little bit of a uh, visualization there, right? There's uh, what we talked about with dispersion forces, moving electrons from one side to the other, right? And just uh, the, in, uh, the, the, the effects of that and whether we have partial negatives and partial positives. What we didn't talk about is the term of polarizability there, right? Well, I didn't mention that term, I should say. We did talk about it, that's all it is. So when you read in the book and it's talking about polarizability, it's just talking about the electrons moving from one side of the classroom to the other. That's all it is. Okay? It's squishiness. Scientific squishiness. Can I shift things from one end of a molecule to the other? Okay? The more I can polarize something, that right, just means the more I can spread it out. The more I can create that separation of partial charges. That's all it is. visualization of this, but it brings an important idea also, which is why I like this picture. So I asked you guys a couple times about what happens when I put a negative and a positive together. And you guys told me, we attract. But what I didn't explicitly talk about is what happens when you put a positive and a positive, or a negative and a negative together. They will what? Repel each other. So if we think about this, right, if we're talking about the electrons moving back and forth, I create a negative over here when I'm standing over here. Now, I'll attract a positive, but I'll also do what? I'll repel another negative. 
So remember, it's always a it's always a give and take in chemistry. We create, or I should be careful. What do I want to say here? It's a good interaction when we make something positive and negative come together, right? It's a return of investment. If I'm an electron and I find another and I find another proton to hang around with, that's good. But if I'm an electron and there's another electron close to me, that's bad. We repel each other. So there's good interactions and there's repulsive interactions, right? There's positive interactions in the, in the positive and the good definition, right? And there's negative interactions in the bad definition. Does that confuse you guys? <laughs> I should be careful using positive and negative when we're talking about charges here and that kind of stuff. Do you guys get what I mean with this? Negative and positive, good, positive and positive, bad. That's all I'm saying, right? So remember, in all of these interactions, this is going to occur. Right, because the principal idea behind every intermolecular interaction is, hey, I've got a buildup of negative, I'm going to attract something positive. That's all it is. Okay? Whether it's temporary or permanent or whatever it might be. Right? So they just have a visualization here about how we can see some of these repulsive interactions also. All right. So here's kind of a table um, uh, for some of these different things that we didn't explicitly talk about. The book talks about ion dipole forces. I'll go ahead and summarize that whole part of the chapter for you. It's something negative attracting something positive, okay? Ionic bonding, we talked about that quite a bit last semester, right? So I'm not really gonna talk about that here, right? It's how we know when ions form and how to name them and what are the charges and can we balance them and whether they're soluble and all that kind of stuff that goes along with that, right? The Coulombic, the completely Coulombic attractions, right? But what's useful is they kind of give you guys a little bit of a scale of energy there. And what it is important to recognize is that ionic bonds are really, really, really strong bonds, okay? Until they're not, but that's a different argument that we have here, right? The more, I'll get, I'll get to you in a second, right? So the, the, the idea is this, right? Why do we even see a scale in the ionic, excuse me, in the intermolecular forces? Well, right? It all comes down to how much of a positive or negative we have, okay? That's where the difference comes in. The bigger the positive, that means it's more attractive to negatives. Make sense? That's all it is, okay? What's up? So are, is ion bonding inter, intermolecular and intramolecular? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they, the, the the difference comes into how do ions arrange themselves in solution um, and in the solid state, okay. right? There's not a, if you think about sodium chloride, there's not a discrete sodium and chloride we can pull out. Why do we call it that then? It's because that's the smallest repeating unit in that system, mm. right? That's the smallest neutral system. But if you, if you could zoom in on uh, sodium chloride, you'd see it's just an infinitely repeating lattice of sodium chloride, sodium chloride, sodium chloride. So, right, so you just pull out the smallest unit and that's what we discuss, okay. right? Because you're right, it's just, you know, sodium is just a spherical ion. It's gonna attract things from every direction and that's in fact what happens, okay. right? So it's, it's a little bit different, that's why I say yes to both of them. Cool. All right, so I think that's kind of a good place to stop for today, right? We kind of went through that nice review there. We introduced kind of the idea and kind of hopefully knock the rust off of some of the, the concepts that we remember from doing that one, okay? So we'll continue on uh, with this on uh, Wednesday and we'll keep working our way through the chapter 12. Rusty Jill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thank you.